all us regenerative farmers are doing are reminding the world what it used to be like to interact with an ecosystem. That's all we're doing. And if we start to focus like 6% of the population in that direction, that may be all it really needs to bring about a significant change, both climate-wise and health-wise, to completely change what we know of as a planet right now. Hello there, beautiful people. I'm just getting back from an extraordinary weekend at the Metabolic Health Summit. I'd highly recommend it next year, and I believe they have some super discounted tickets on sale now. I don't know how much it costs, but it's worth it. It's an entire weekend of hanging around all the top researchers and doctors in the space, and not only getting to see their latest research and their presentations, but getting to talk to them about it in person. Everyone is walking around and available to talk to. It's so cool. And of course, all the attendees are awesome as well. I got seven more interviews for Food Lies, and I guess the second film that will no doubt be made. I also did some really cool panel discussions that will go on YouTube. The first one was with crowd favorite Dr. Ben Bickman, and two of my new best pals, the lovely Dr. Jamie Seaman and Dr. Asim Maholtra, the renowned British cardiologist. The second panel was with two-time world champion rower and PhD Brianna Stubbs, two-time world record holding ultra runner Zach Vitter, and two-time hanging out with Brian, nutrition, metabolism, and exercise physiology expert, Mike Mutzel. These will be out on YouTube soon and maybe as a podcast as well. So many great connections and fun things in the works. I can't begin to name them all. So on to today's guests, John and Molly. They are an amazing couple that own Apricot Lane Farms, which is just north of Los Angeles. They spent the last eight years creating a thriving, regenerative, certified, organic farm, growing many kinds of animals and countless fruit, vegetable, and cover crops. They documented this journey for most of the eight years and made an award-winning film called The Biggest Little Farm. You can watch it on iTunes, Amazon, or Hulu, and I suggest you do this immediately, maybe even before listening on any further. I won't spoil any of the story and leave it for them to highlight in this podcast or for you to watch in the film. Before we start, I'll just mention a few other things. If you're new to this podcast, I started episode one. It's best to experience the whole journey and soak up the valuable information from each hand-picked guest. You also should know about NoseToTail.org, where we deliver grass-finished, sustainably raised beef, buffalo, lamb, as well as our one-of-a-kind high omega-3 pork and chicken. This is special stuff that is not only beyond organic and humanely raised, but is fed a special diet so that the meat has an extremely high omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. It's in high demand, so we can only sell the bacon one package at a time. Our other signature product is the primal ground beef with liver, heart, kidney, and spleen mixed in. Very tasty stuff. I've seen and heard of so many kids chowing down on this stuff and enjoying it immensely. They don't mind the organ taste at all, and I think they have an intuitive sense for the superior nutrition it provides. Again, that's all at nosetotail.org. That's my company, so you can get your meat there and support me in a small way and our ranch in Texas in a bigger way. You can also support the Food Lies film on Indiegogo.com by clicking through foodlies.org. We still are taking pre-orders and have the Eat Meat shirts there. We're in the last steps of getting the film finished, but still need your help. You can also get the private food and exercise videos as well as extended show notes for this podcast by becoming a Patreon supporter on patreon.com slash pqman. And if you'd like to support in a non-monetary way, you can give the podcast a review on iTunes or the Apple Podcast app and share any of these things with family and friends, of course. Thanks so much, everyone. It wouldn't be possible without you. Please enjoy the really insightful and beautiful words of John and Molly Chester. Hello, John and Molly. Thanks for having me up here. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's great to have you up. Well, I saw your film, The Biggest Little Farm. It was so awesome. I just wanted to come up here and talk to you and learn more about what you guys are doing. And everyone I interview has been talking about different angles of this. You know, we hit nutrition. We hit, you know, I talked to Gabe Brown, has bigger farms. But I think your situation is really cool. And why don't you just tell us about it to begin with? Um, well, Apricot Lane Farms is a um, regenerative farm. We're certified biodynamic and organic, but really what we focus on as a regenerative farm or biodynamic farm is trying to create a self-contained ecosystem. So we're, you know, we're utilizing, you know, wildlife um, and the restoration of natural habitats to bring a balance back onto a farm to help essentially um, prevent epidemics of pests and disease through this great sort of um, wide range of diversity. Mm-hmm. Um, at the same time, um, we focus exclu- probably predominantly on 
the regeneration of soil. Because really that top 10 or so inches is our farm's immune system. So we're building the immunology of our farm through soil system regeneration and the regeneration of biodiversity. That was what stuck out to me. It's like that was the driving force of the films. Like this is the problem solving that nature is amazing. It's like harmonious cycles and the circle of life. And that, well, I don't want to spoil it all, but there's so many things that happen when nature interacts with each other and problem solving and everything works. And it's so funny how opposite it is with other types of farming where you're just fighting it the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've gotten into the idea of growing food as cheaply as possible. And in order to do, do that, we've become, as a species, as a human species, we've become very preoccupied with this idea of controlling um, the outcomes um, uh, with you know, either uh, chemicals or industrialized methods. But we've been unaware for the last 260 years We've been unaware of the consequences to essentially abandoning the toolbox that exists within nature's diversity. So we've never really focused on how do you cultivate diversity and cultivate, you know, the land to be able to grow food from it. We've never, we haven't done those two things in really 260 years. Yeah. So what our ancestors did kind of have it figured out, right? Or nature figures itself out. And then we went, everything we do in society is all about volume or efficiency. And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. But, well, let's start with the film, actually. So where did it start? You started filming so long ago. How did you have that idea to start filming this? Well, I didn't, I, I quit the film business, you know, uh, over eight years ago in order to do this project with my wife. Um, and, and I... I was filming things only because they were interesting to me, but I never really thought I would ever make a film about it. And honestly, there was part of me that was pretty skeptical that it was going to work in the way that we had hoped. Um, but I, I realized by year five that I had amassed this footage of these specific keystone players within our ecosystem that were actually returning to our land to help balance out those epidemics of pest and disease pressure. And that's when I was like, wow, this is a story that's never been told. And I've been essentially capturing some key player elements in it. This would make a really good story. And I think it would help people understand, because I didn't understand eight years ago, really what we mean by a farm as an ecosystem or regenerative farming, et cetera. Because there's never really been a visual way to explain to people in great detail what that looks like. And mm -hmm. so I had inadvertently captured an eight-year process of taking a land piece of land that had been extractively farmed for 45 years, pummeled and killed of its from, a, you know, destroyed its biodiversity, and in less than seven or eight years, watch it come back to better than what it was with just some intention for an understanding and appreciation for the consequences. Mm. And Molly, how did you get started in this? Were you, were you like a food blogger? Is that, tell me about yeah, it. Yeah, I was a private chef uh -huh. and, um, I came to culinary in the first place because I had some of my own health challenges and I started to really understand that what I was eating was affecting how I felt and I came to learn more about the gut microbiome and how um, using things like fermented foods mm -hmm. and then getting deep nutrition through bone broths and things like that was really the foundation of rebuilding some of the challenges that I had. And um, back then it was a little bit more obscure, the, some of those things, mm -hmm. but you could find pockets of people who were really into it. And we then um, were out in Los Angeles. I was private chefing and we would visit different farmers to try to find farmers who were really focused on the types of methods that can build soil. And we knew a limited amount at that point, but we, um, we were we couldn't find, it started with eggs. We couldn't find somebody that was creating really great eggs. And so we talked about, what if we did this? What if we just got some chickens? And our dog was barking his head off and it just kind of all converged that the solution to life was mm -hmm. to start a farm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like a gigantic means to an end. But now we live on this great space and have wonderful food to work with and hopefully can have some impact. I love that. A lot of people in my little nutrition worlds kind of start on this path and then they get like a little backyard farm. They have like a few chickens and yeah. and then you just took it to the next level. 
And also, you mentioned deep nutrition. Do you know the, uh, Dr. Kate Shanahan by any chance? No, is that a her? book title? It's a book title <laughs> called Deep Nutrition, and she talks about fermented vegetables and bone broth there you and go. all that stuff. I would probably like her. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I recommend the book highly. I had her on my podcast as well. She's that's amazing. Uh, well, that's great that you, yeah, you're, you start with this health. I think so many people have these health problems, and it leads them down these paths. Yeah, it does. We um, always say that when we have somebody that comes on the farm as a woofer, an apprentice, and they already have been through some sort of health journey, um, they already have an intimate understanding of what we're then teaching them with soil mm -hmm. because there's just so much that's interrelated there. It's mm -hmm. really... Yeah, specifically fractals. if the way they healed themselves with through, was through an understanding of changing of their diet, yes. <clears throat> right, to heal the gut microbiome. And as soon as you start drawing the connection between gut microbiome and soil microbiome, it's like it's done for people. They, they get it. So there's like this four-dimensional appreciation for it. And then you understand all the work that goes into treating the soil a certain way so that it's healthy, mm -hmm. you know, will generate the same effect, you know, that your body. Yeah, the would body. Be. Yeah. I'm getting really into this soil stuff. Have you heard of this author, David Montgomery? He wrote Dirt, Erosions of Civilizations. And it, he talks about how when you look, uh, civilization loses their soil health, they lose their population health and then it, it kind of disintegrates from there and wars and all throughout history the civilizations have collapsed after right they've re used up their soil it's so true like national security public health right water security all these things are related to soil i mean if a nation can't feed its people and can't feed its people in the healthiest way possible then you know it's going to spend two trillion dollars a year on health care you know mm -hmm. it just so it's great i love i love hearing stories like that yeah well, tell us about the WOLF program. So not many people know about that. Yeah, uh, that was John, really, uh, if you want to tell him about it. That was you at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, we knew that um, it was probably going to take more hands than uh, we had in order to build this very diverse ecosystem. And we um, also wanted to be able to pass down the experiences um, of what we were learning and, and uh, finding and discovering along the way to, the, to future generations. Um, so we got involved with Wolf Worldwide Opportunity on Organic Farms, and it's essentially a portal. People sign up, and then they get access to a bunch of different farms that are looking for helpers. And we have a very specific kind of um, requirement. We require three months. It's full time. Um, they get uh, room and board, and um, they um, are really integrated into the team. And then the, a lot of those individuals have been hired full time here on the farm and work here now and run various departments. Um, but they can hop around the world and, and experience lots of different farming methods. And I kind of wish we had done that first before we started. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great way to save money by watching other farmers make terrible mistakes on their dime, not yours. Yeah. Well, I bet people listening, I bet there's going to be a lot of people that would be interested in doing this. So it's, but is it a long uh, process? Yeah, you list? just apply through our portal at apricotlanefarms.com. They could also sign up to be through the Wolf Portal. Um, and it's www.wofusa.org, I think, or mm -hmm. it'll correct for you. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, but then you could sign up to, through that portal and find us through that portal as well. Mm. Yeah. But we, we, um, yeah, we, we're, we get a lot of applications from all over the world. Yeah. We have a cool board that's in where everybody eats lunch. That's every face of every person that's been through the oh, wow. every woofer, yeah. And there's Hopefully. over, I don't know, maybe 120 at the three point. Yeah, after three months, you get your a magnet with your face on it. Yeah. <laughs> you get a hat at three weeks, uh, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll tour around a little bit, and you know, maybe we can put up a little bit of this video just um, that we're going to shoot just on my phone <laughs> so people watching on YouTube can see a little bit of this stuff after. But uh yeah, so how many people? Yeah, how many people do you have? No, and there's here? also videos about the... I mean, obviously, there's the movie, The Biggest Little Farm, but there's also videos on our website that show mm. other things about the I'll farm. I'll direct people in the yeah, show notes. Yeah, so I just... Yeah, yeah so, how many, so how many people are working here, and temporary and permanent? So right now, we have 20... So keep in mind, we're going into, like, you know, past almost year eight now, um, and we have uh, 20 agricultural-focused uh, team members, um, and then now, because the whole way this method of farming is going to work is about direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to sell direct to consumer and you're going to be the retailer, be the delivery truck driver, right? Mm -hmm. Be the packer, be the shipper. That's now a whole nother industry you're getting into. And so that coupled with the fact that we grow 250 different things. So we have to have pickers, 
um, and packers available year round with the farmer's market, all that stuff, it ends up being almost 60 people at certain mm. times of the year. Um, that also includes a few people that we have on staff for events. So we'll do like once a month, we'll do tours of the farm. We don't do them as re- regular as some people. We just can't um, time wise, but that's another enterprise that really helps bring and build culture around what we're, you know, what we're trying to build here. Yeah. I love that. Where it's why well, I visited Joel Salton's farm and he has all the tours too. And then the direct to consumer, that's kind of the new model is, is people does well, for one, just going outside of the food industry, which I'm always a fan of and getting straight to the person. What farmer's markets do you add and what kind of products do you have? So we're in, we just have expanded a little bit more, but we just recently got into Santa Monica Wednesday, which is a big market for us. We've been trying to get in there for a lot of years. So we're happy about that. Um, Thousand Oaks Thursday, um, Calabasas Saturday, uh, Santa Monica Sunday, Mar Vista Sunday, and Ooh. then we just got in one in Larchmont that I'm not sure of the day of that. It might be Sunday. Um, updates beyond that can be on our website, but those are our staples. And we've just added on two more, I believe. I love it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm, that's my it's my area. I go to the Mar Vista one on Sunday. Oh, good. Yeah, we're and there. And then the Santa Monica one as well. Good. So you have all kinds of meat and vegetable fruit products. What do you... What we do. You, yeah. Yeah, we have um, sheep, uh, so lamb, pork, beef roaster chickens eggs the eggs sell out really fast but they are at the different markets um and then we have vegetables from our uh, vegetable garden which is somewhat small we're at about like two and a half acres so um that all goes to the farmers markets and then we have our orchard fruits citrus in the winter and then all of our stone fruits in the summer fall is figs persimmons pomegranates kind of we our diversity. I so we've got it. a little bit of everything. I love it. Well, that's the whole point of it. Yeah. I mean, well, we, we should start talking about the film more too. It's because I learned so. I mean, I just learned about just by watching. I just watched it twice. Christy's here filming and uh, we watched it again. It's, it's so cool how when one thing went bad, then you figured out the solution naturally. Yeah. So, so can you tell us like, so the first thing I think like the coyotes and the chickens was a, sort of a big kind of thing yeah well yeah like um before i go into that maybe i i think the there's a lot of these methods that we're using that have been around for years and other farmers use, and some of them are very simple things Mm -hmm. but i think the point that the film makes is that you know with contained deep within each problem if you're willing to go a lot further than normally feels comfortable to allow yourself to be in that like that period of shame and embarrassment with the failure, mm. long enough to get to know why the problem even exists, you will find a much more um, potent solution if you understand why all the different parts exist in some form to balance out the harmony to the ecosystem that you may not appreciate. So like coyotes exist for a reason. So it's easy to say, all right, well, coyotes are killing chickens. We should just kill the coyotes. But if you start to look at what the coyote does in your ecosystem, you begin to have this reverence for it. And you realize that then that would start another problem if you eliminate all the coyotes. Like for ours, uh, coyotes eat rabbits and gophers and actually quite a bit. And they're also pollinators because they're moving through the landscape and they're you know, pollinating arguably native landscape. They're moving, you know, fungal spores around. Good things too, right? So for us, it was about coyotes killing chickens. And it wasn't until we realized that of all the guardian dogs, uh, that um, most of our guardian dogs would eat chickens too. But one of our guardian dogs ended up killing a chicken. It was a pet chicken. And the Mm -hmm. mate of that dog didn't kill the chicken and had no blood on its mouth. And we realized in that moment that that other dog was actually one that probably would be cool with chickens. And we figured out a way to keep that dog Mm -hmm. with the chickens, et cetera. But that's not some revolutionary thing. It just sort of what I think what's revolutionary, at least what was profound to me, was the appreciation we took to understand what else the coyote was doing in our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Not so much the solution that we use to solve that problem. Yeah, it's the power of observation. And that's really everything is about getting curious on this farm and going as deep as you can with that. And then we've chosen a boundary of not using synthetic ingredients, synthetic sprays and things like that, which can create um, 
a ability to see more clearly because you it forces you to listen because you don't have that ability to just pull a trigger and go in another direction. Yeah, because I think it's like, I mean, I think we've all been raised to look at the world through this lens of right and wrong. Like, that's right, that's wrong. I agree with that. I don't agree with that. But what we're not taught, and this is a much scarier sort of perspective to have, it's a lens of that's a little too loose for people. And that is like, instead of saying right or wrong, what are the consequences to that thing's existence? Or why does that exist? Why do gangs exist? You know, they're not all bad people because they're in a gang. It's a product of an environment that is consequential that started way before the gang was developed. The gang is a solution, right, within an urban mm-hmm. environment to a problem that where there is a, uh, a broken families and um, disconnected culture and community, right? And so I think with farming, it's the same way. You just have to look at everything not as the enemy, but really as a consequence of nature that's serving some greater role. And then you start to find these ways to intersect with it. Not always perfectly. That's so beautiful. Also, I want to say it's such a beautiful movie, beautifully shot. I mean, you come from a cinematography background, but also beautifully written. And you, you telling these stories, and it's it was really great to well as a filmmaker myself, you know, trying to I'm trying to write some stuff right now, and it's I really appreciated your insight on all this, and I think the biggest difference is the the main methods of farming seem to be working against nature. And your whole thing is learning about working with nature. Yeah. I mean, I guess you, you just kind of explained it. Well, give us one more example, the, the snails. Um, yeah. So like uh, snails um, are a non-native uh, pest uh, that uh, attack mostly our citrus trees, specifically the leaves, which destroys the plant's ability to photosynthesize and create, you know, carbonic sugars that go into the ground and into the fruit. And um, we started planting cover crops in order to build the soil, which just makes the um, snail issue even worse. Um, so we made our snail issue worse. And then we realized we uh, at the same time we had uh, these ducks we were raising in a pond. And there's so many of because we're raising for their eggs. And there's so many of these ducks, they created this problem with, uh, pu- you know, putting too much, essentially polluting the pond with too, mu- with too much nutrients, like too much nitrogen and phosphorus. And while observing the ducks one day, I noticed they were actually eating snails off the grasses around the pond. And we have this amazing problem with snails in our orchards. And we just put this, the ducks in the orchards and they obliterated 96,000 snails in a seven acre sort of plot of land over the period of a, about a year and turned our snail problem into um, fertilization for the trees. And yeah. on top of that, feeding ducks escargot makes some of the richest duck egg you could Mm. ever um, imagine so you know one problem turned into two really cool um, benefits to the farm that's so awesome we had there's footage there's so many snails like it didn't even make sense how many snails were on some of those trees you couldn't even see the trunks of the trees they were literally just bubbled with snails yeah but that's it's so obvious how nature works and now you got this so this amazing manure created by them and I guess that's why your eggs are so popular. Yeah. You, yeah. It's really just seeing a purpose in everything. Mm-hmm. And that, that translates into your team too. Then it, you know, learning this lens and farming then affected the way that we managed because you don't look at something as a problem. You instead look at it as why is it there? What's going mm-hmm. on? Like John was describing with the gangs and it becomes the next layer of support that you're trying to create in your ecosystem. Everything is within the ecosystem and mm-hmm. what is it doing inside of there? Well, I think more things need to be thought of that way in our society. I like the reference to gangs because people are like drug problems. They're just like, oh, let's just let's say make drugs illegal and lock people up. But it's like, why do people do drugs? They do drugs because they have a void inside, or they have past trauma, or they're trying to get away from something. So right, we're look. I think we're a ba- we're a band aid culture. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. that's what our modern healthcare system is. It's a band aid. But we're talking about like like I like the word wound socket. It's actually because I made this film called Lost in Wound Socket, but it's mm-hmm. different. But a wound socket is like a a wound that's just very deep and you can't really get to, and you can't put a band aid over that and think that you've gotten all the anaerobic bacteria out of it. It's gonna fester up. It's gonna cause an abscess. And I think we're this culture that's completely comfortable living in like these 
going from abscess to abscess and never really going deep enough into a problem to understand why it exists and be reflective in that. And like right now, agriculturally, I think we look at the problems in agriculture as being one, how do we solve it in the most economically sensible way? But it's so short-sighted because at some point we're paying for it over and over and over again, our short-sightedness. We're paying for it in healthcare by creating nutrient deficient food, right? Um, or we're paying for it in loss of topsoil. Like right now, just in this country alone, we lose $44 billion worth of topsoil every year. Mm-hmm. That's insane. Through, an, through a form of, of, um, of uh, economical influence to encourage farmers to the tune of $20 billion a year to farm in a way, because that's the subsidy, $20 billion a year to farm in an extractive way that continues driving the loss of soil and water, Right. It's just like the way we look at that stuff is so short-sighted. And again, to me, it's just an abscess that continues to grow in this country and other countries that are developing that look at farming through only its economic lens in the most short-sighted way, not the long-term 20- or 30-year plan. And In my opinion, the thing that's underneath that abscess, one of the things, is grief. And I think in this mm. culture, we, are, we don't allow ourselves that process of grief And that's what in the film, we always kind of chuckle about the fact that it's this film that can, if somebody's going to say something negative, they're going to say it's earnest. It's this is too earnest or this. Mm -hmm. Well, John killed, showed the death of how many animals in that film? Well, I didn't kill them, but we showed Mm -hmm. the death of over 130,000 living beings. But Mm -hmm. we did it in a way that you were able to appreciate the purposefulness of impermanence, of the impermanence of life. And I, I, I do love it when people say, oh, well, it's a very earnest way of looking. I'm like, no, no, there is more mm. things died in this film than most films. Mm. But you just had an appreciation for it that it somehow allowed the human experience watching it to accept it and appreciate, value it and have reverence for it. Instead of it just seeing like a terrible thing that didn't make sense and didn't have a reason. In other words, we played through the consequences of our existence and the consequences associated to impermanence. And I believe that that's why whenever you get to the end of the film, the feeling that you feel that feels so gratifying that I got to experience because I didn't make the film. So I got Mm -hmm. to just sit there and feel the same thing that the audience did, Mm -hmm. which was such deep appreciation for the journey that I just went on through watching that film, even though it was weirdly my life. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah. And so, and that's what I've had to learn through being a farmer is to be more attached to grief because it it's around you all the time. Death is so much more uh, real and and right there with you whenever you're attached to biology. And I think that that's our disconnection from the earth in general has caused us to disconnect from grief or to be able to disconnect from that. And therefore, then it's just the Band-Aid and the Band-Aid and the Band-Aid. And each Band-Aid that gets put on covers up our intuition. And the covering of that intuition is separating us from our ability to navigate things without um, modern medicine, which isn't, it's not that it shouldn't have a place. It's that it shouldn't have a place in front of our intuition. Wow. This is amazing. This is really, so people who are farmers who understand this, they seem to be on a different level of understanding, right? Than normal people. And I so I bring up Tara Couture a lot. She, she's an amazing woman who has a farmstead in Canada, and she's writing a book about death. And she would love everything you just said. Like, but she is so focused on this topic of how disconnected we are and how it's the, the, it is the root of our problems. Like I, I'm online a lot, and I deal with anti-meat uh, activists a lot, and they're attacking me because I'm pro-meat and saying it's healthy. And they are, I think, just disconnected. They're scared of death. They're scared of this. They don't understand it. They're in cities and they don't see the process. But then you two have experienced it firsthand and you appreciate life because you deal with death on a regular basis. You know, let me say something about that. I actually, you know, I, I we get, you know, sometimes uh, we have, uh, you know, a very outspoken vegan who doesn't understand the process of what soil is and what, um, you know, what an ecosystem is and how it works attack us. But, you know, we need vegans, we need vegetarians, and we need meat eaters. We need diversity of diets. And the one thing I think we can all agree on is that if any life is going to be sacrificed to benefit my existence, then it's owed the highest form of 
re reverence and the um, highest form of humane treatment. And, we, you know, we are the stewards of these animals. But um, and so they're in our care. So therefore, we need to address those things and treat them very seriously. And I'd be right there with any vegan marching against an industrialized CAFOS operation. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't believe in those. I think they're deplorable. And I think meat needs to be more expensive so that farmers can, you know, um, raise the animals in the healthiest, most natural environment um, possible. Now, that said, from a vegan's perspective, this is something they don't actually know very often because not many farmers will tell them this. But this is this goes for any farm around me growing avocados or lemons, whatever. For me to grow 214 acres worth of like stone fruit and avocados in this farm requires me to kill at least 35 to 40,000 gophers a year, thousands of ground squirrels, thousands of bees, thousands of butterflies, thousands of hummingbirds. Those last three things completely by accident. The other two are predators or pests that I would kill intentionally, right? But just in spraying a, a, a non a non synthetically derived organic um, spray that has maybe like a mineral oil base in it, that'll suffocate and kill a bee or a butterfly or a ladybug, right? Or even a hummingbird baby. So if you're eating, you have blood on your hands. And I think it's important for everyone to understand that that process for you to have food on your plate at some point, something and probably many things died. And I would say, I would... You tell, show me a vegan who has grown food for more than five to eight years and only eaten from their garden. That's it exclusively. Mm -hmm. I will show you a vegan who has killed some shit as soon as they mm -hmm. start losing tomatoes to a rabbit or something else. Because if their survival is based on that exclusively, they're going to end up having to face being protective over their ability to live. So it's something we should be very careful with. And that's why I would say if you're a vegan and you're trying to understand how it is that we can do what we can do, take the time to understand how soil was built and how soil is regenerated. And it answers all of life's questions. It's hard for them to do that. And I'll make another reference to Lear Keith, who wrote a book called The Vegetarian Myth. Beautiful book. Beautiful book. And she tried to farm. Yeah, she tried yes. to grow her own food and she learned to become a better vegan. To become a better yeah. vegan. She was all in 20 years. She was trying to do it. And yeah. she understood what it took. It took death for life. And another Tara Couture quote, we filmed with her on her farm. She said, it's, she was referring to a plate of a vegan meal. It's death on a plate, but there's just no blood. And I got the chills. I keep watching this YouTube video and I, I get the chills, but it's, it's Joseph so Joseph Campbell always said the difference between a meat eater and a vegetarian is that the vegetarian is just eating life, a form of life that couldn't run. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's it's all one. And you have to just be careful because I was a vegetarian for a long time. That's my body didn't agree with it. And that's part of what caused the recipe of my health declining in my 20s that I had to crawl back. And so I take it very seriously as far as there are some people on this earth that need meat and that I am one of those people. So when I came back to eating meat, it was about how are these animals raised? That's how I could justify being able to come back to meat. But the trap I think that I can see into a little bit from having been in, uh, as a part of it, not a vegan, but I was a vegetarian, mm -hmm. is that it can slide into a space of perfectionism that it, perfectionism doesn't work in our society. Like it, uh, on our globe, anytime you're sliding mm. into perfectionism, there's something going on that's not going to work. And in Lear Keith, is that her name? Yep, in yep. her book, she describes how in Africa, putting all of the herbivores on one side and all the carnivores on the other, mm -hmm. that that was a solution a vegan had had come up with. And and I don't say that to poke fun because I get... <laughs> but it I've, is funny. Yeah, it, it is, is funny. funny. <laughs> but I, I have uh, slid into spaces of perfectionism in my own life. I understand how you can get there, but it mm -hmm. is important for us to recognize that that is coming from a state of perfectionism. So And we can't achieve that and that we are all a part of the cycle of life and to step outside of the cycle of life where is where everything starts to go haywire we need to step into it and in stepping into it we need to bear the responsibility of it and inside of that then we can find peace i love that i love that and well here's another maybe you can respond to this a, a vegan once told me that the deaths are not intentional for their food so they're saying what's the difference so you're saying that accidentally hitting running someone over is okay and it's the same as purposely killing someone so yeah. But the deaths, you, but yeah. the deaths, in order to protect food crop, um, where um, life is, you know, from a bee to an ant to a gopher, 
uh, to a rabbit is is intentional to some degree. I mean, at least the rabbit and the gopher part, because there's we have uh, ground squirrels here, and they get into the root zones of our orchard trees and, you know, they nick a root and then that's verticillium can get in there, um, bacteria, and then cause that, that plant to die. <clears throat> and then gophers obviously eat roots too, and just have destroyed tons of our trees. Um, so there is intentional, um, protection, um, over being able to allow maybe uh, a very healthy vegan to eat a avocado. Mm. Well, okay. Well, let's go on to the soil. I, I love the soil health thing because you said that what if a vegan really understood soil health? Yeah. Can I have actually, I just, yeah. there's like something I like, like when it comes, people think of like the circle of life, mm-hmm. they're always like, oh, I love your farm because it's the circle of life. And it, it actually isn't a circle. And I think there's something that I've, I've kind of come to understand that may help clear up a little bit of what we're mm-hmm. talking about as it relates to soil. It's actually not a circle. It's an eight, right? And if you look at the eight, um, and you sort of go from the center, this, the, you know, the center part of the eight and you're going up to the first top of the circle. That's like the birth stage. And as you get to the top, you begin to kind of come around, swinging now down to the bottom, going back to that center of the eight. And that's the sort of the beginning of the death stage. And then right as it sort of at that cross section of the eight, that's the part where it begins to go through the decomposition stage. And now you're underneath the ground in that decomposition stage. And then as you're coming right back up around to the part of the X again, that's the reanimation stage. And the X factor of life is soil and the x of that eight is the soil system taking and pumping life back into death over and over and over again and if you turn the eight on its side that's the sign for infinity Infinity. right and if you look at any religion from around the world they're always talking about life is everlasting and it's always continuing and it's actually true our dog todd is buried in our backyard um he um is buried a few feet away from a peach tree he's underground now microbes are tearing him apart our muscular mycorrhizae fungi is seeking out the phosphorus that was once todd and zinc and any other component of todd and feeding Todd now to that peach tree. And then that peach tree blooms off a flower. And then uh, that flower becomes, after being pollinated, a piece of fruit. Molly and I go over and bite that peach and we just ate Todd, right? It's everlasting. It goes into us and the whole system again. And if I die on that soil, I would be digested by that soil and turned back all into the food sources of life as we know it. So it's we're all a part of this process. And I think having reverence for how soil is built and the cycle of life is a really important thing to understand as you start to point fingers about what's right and what's wrong. Yeah, we don't even like to say, um, that was beautifully said. I love it. Um, But I don't even like to say that there's never a use for a pesticide ever. I don't even Mm. like, I don't even think about that. Mm -hmm. It's not even my worry to think of whether that is or isn't. Although we can't on this farm because we're certified. We don't on this farm. Not synthetically derived pesticides. Yes, we obviously have made a choice on this farm and it's the choice that rings right to our instincts. And that's what I wouldn't, I would have no instincts if I was spraying something here. So that's what's right for us. And that's how we've chosen to enter the world. And through this, it it gives regenerative farming and alternative farming methods a greater voice, which I think is absolutely necessary. Is it something that the whole world ends up adopting? Great. If it, if that's what it is, is it meant to be part of a patchwork of other things? Great. I don't even really think about what that is, but we don't have to, to judge that. We can kind of stay in the lane of what's right for us and not try to say what's right necessarily for somebody else and let kind of the bigger picture work, work itself out. I love this so much. I want to include this in my film. <laughs> like that, that eight thing is so beautiful. And visually, I want to show this. But okay, so how, tell people how it can even work without pesticides because it's all about the soil health. Right. Can you tell us a little more about, well, yeah, it's two things. I, I think, look, the, the, like people say this film is this film and our farm is not meant to be prescriptive that we're not coming from on high. I mean, we're not naive and thinking that, that this would even work down the road because mm-hmm. every, you know, biome is a little bit different, mm-hmm. but there are two things that apply around the world that we do. And it's a lens that we use, right? And this lens is the most important thing and it begins to instruct the individual farmer or farmers in how they need to make decisions. And that is that we use a lens where we look out every single day and we say, how can what we do regenerate soil and biodiversity? Because those two things are the building blocks of the immune system of our microcosm, this farm, which is this microcosm of our 
country and our planet, right? And when we say immune system, I mean ecosystem. It's one and the same. Um, I forgot your question. Uh, well, I was saying, how do, how does it even work to have grow all these plants without pesticides? Oh, oh yeah, right. It's like so. It's it's about finding the diversity within those natural mm-hmm. systems that help balance those things out. Like, um, you know, in the beginning, we used to spray for thrips, which essentially for avocados, they just scar the fruit at a really young age, and then that grows into a very big looking ugly scar. It doesn't actually affect for that particular fruit flavor at all. But it downgrades the value of the fruit. Mm -hmm. And in the eye of the consumer, that's damaged goods, even though the fruit tastes the same. But after a while, we had been growing cover crops and regenerating different habitats on the farm. All the different predator species that may balance out those thrips came into play. And suddenly our thrip population was incredibly low and there was no need to even worry about that anymore. Um, We see it with like... um, uh, a- Asian citrus psyllid, right, which wiped out 50% of the crop, citrus crop in Florida. Um, we have m- copious amounts of ladybugs on this farm now because of our cover crop. They just they eat the the nymph stage of the Asian citrus psyllid. We have wolf spiders. They climb up and eat tons of the psyllids. And we have there's even like a wren that sort of flips upside down on these trees and eats off the psyllids and things like that. We have guinea hens and there's a whole bunch of other host of creatures that come into play that balance out the psyllid and even aphid infestations. So that's one way. The other way is that in the soil at the soil level, if you have a a sort of a a bacterial outbreak of verticillium, there's other things that would balance out whatever that organism is and how that's working your system as long as there's diversity and competition. So essentially the the answer to your question, how do we how do we utilize nature to sort of prevent the use of having to use pesticides and, and antibiotics? Diversity. Mm-hmm. You want to create a healthy sense of competition so not one thing can become like a monocrop of destruction. Mm-hmm. Another thing that you you want to do is you want to look at it from all angles because there's not just one answer that's going to solve a problem. There's multiple things and it's kind of stages that you would go through. And I can give an example um, in the human form for that might be more relatable. But the other night, my son wasn't feeling good. Our son wasn't feeling good. And he um, as soon he had this thing where he was coughing and couldn't breathe right at that, hopefully you're hitting it many steps before. You're like, what is he eating? What has, has he been sleeping enough? You're looking at all mm-hmm. the different stages so you can start to understand that. And then you have the crisis. And then at that point, I'm just going into an exploratory phase of what are all the different things that I can do to support this so that it doesn't continue to go down in a negative direction and starts to turn instead into a positive. So you, it might be like we understand fever and that fever we would allow to go we would, you know, I'm looking into homeopathy, I'm getting the humidifier on, I'm doing all of those things so that hopefully it's starting to turn the other way. You're only turning to something. The whole point is to not have to get to antibiotics because once you get over to that phase, you're obliterating everything that's positive. Well, that's the diversity, going, you start yeah, to the, attack the diversity. Exactly. Yeah. So you're trying not to attack the diversity and instead hit it from all angles so that you're supporting that diversity to get it through to the other side. It's a, just a different way mm-hmm. of looking at things. Well, it's exactly the same. Yeah, the human body and the farm are the same. Yeah, if you, Same. You, you take the antibiotics, you're going to screw up your whole microbiome. It's a, I haven't taken antibiotics in 10, 15 years. Yeah. I, I'm right. Yeah, so the same thing with the soil, right? I, I think you look at everything in nature as a fractal. Like you're a fractal example of this organism of this farm, and that's a fractal example of the organism of this planet. And there's actually, you know, millions of stages in between, but that's exactly what it is. There's a lot to be gleaned from just understanding the complexity of those fractal elements that we see every single day in our life. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So what about the water? So the soil, good soil can soak up water. So in the film, you got a big rainstorm and you actually soaked up all the water and then say neighboring farms that don't do the regenerative practices, the soil isn't even available or able Right. to soak up that water and we're not, off. Yeah, and we're not given an allocation of water. We're, ba- we're mainly dependent upon an aquifer. We get about 12 inches of rain here, allegedly. In the first eight years, there was a historic drought, the worst drought in 1,200 years, which is all documented in the film. <laughs> mm-hmm. We got less than four or five inches a year during that time period. But anyway, yes, so we get no additional allocation. So we have to do all of this on the same amount of water that our neighbor would use based on what they're growing. So I don't get additional 
uh, allocation for cover crop. But you know, cover crop does a couple of things. Uh, most a well, couple. One is it it obviously um, creates a rainforest like canopy over the soil, which kind of keeps uh, eliminates uh, the evaporation mm -hmm. effect. But also, those root systems are obviously drilling in and creating a porosity. They're feeding microorganisms and fungal organisms, right? That allow for aggregates to be built, and that's like a a, a soil that's becoming stable that has. Um, an aerobic environment with lots of space becomes like a sponge and you're increasing something called soil organic matter. And I, I bring that up because soil organic matter levels help you sort of determine a couple of things. One is a 1% increase in soil organic matter. And we increased ours 3% in seven years. Um, a 1% increase on one acre of land in the top four to six inches can hold about 16,500 to about 20,000 gallons of water per acre, mm. just a 1% increase. Mm -hmm. And we've increased it 3% on top of the 3% that may have already been there, or even the 4% that was already there. So water holding capacity. Another thing that happens is a 1% increase on one of soil organic matter on one acre of land also requires the drawdown of 21 tons of atmospheric carbon, 21 tons. So we have, we have areas on this farm that had soil organic matter levels as high as 11%, which is really high. We've contributed at least 3% to get it to that 11% through our farming practices. But 11%, imagine how much carbon is being held beneath the ground there. And imagine the water holding capacity of that area that is in the 6 to 11%. It's insane. So now our plants are insulated against these like periods of drought because all this water is sort of there at the ready. And that's one of the things that helps sort of slow down fires. If the tree has water below the ground, it can actually evaporate cool and be a little bit more of a of resistant to the blowtorch effect of these fires that are raging through Southern California. Um, so we, in this last year, had 24 inches of rain and that equates to over 140 million gallons of water that we sequestered on this land that did not run away. And whatever the plants didn't use and whatever didn't stay in that top six or so inches went back into our aquifer for future generations. That's a lot of water. That's amazing. What would happen? So give us an example of what happened to a neighbor who was just doing monocrops. So a monocrop so. operation that doesn't have cover crop, you know, in about an hour, a half inch of rain can wipe out easily a half inch, quarter inch, maybe even up to an inch of topsoil that could have taken years, hundreds of years to build. And now that's gone with its nutrients and the water out into the ocean causing eutrophication and acidification. But the thing is, is that they're not raising their plants to be independent thinkers. They're raising their plants to be ever dependent 25 year old children that can't mm. figure out how to use a credit card, how to source food for themselves. Those root systems beneath those trees have no relationships with our buscular mycorrhizae fungi, right? Where they're rewarding those, those fungal pathways to get phosphorus and zinc and other things that they can get from the ground because they're not incentivized because the farmer gives them everything they need. So really for them, a lot of monocrop operations, soil is just a medium with which to hold the plant up. Everything else comes in the form of a synthetically derived fertilizer or some chemical warfare to prevent the pest and disease issue that is directly related to those farming practices. I wish the vegan activists understood this. Well, I guess they're against monocropping as well, but just to know about soil health, to educate people on soil health is not an easy task. It does, it's not sexy. You know, it's like who wants to watch a film about soil? And that's why we made the film that we did we, we, without, I mean, it's not polarizing. I don't think it points fingers at anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, we just wanted people to fall in love with the infinite complex beauty of a diverse ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Because wh who is going to want to know all this stuff? Who's going to mm -hmm. want to know what like microorganisms do and what, you know, what uh, uh, mycorrhizae fungi is? If yeah. you don't have an appreciation for how incredibly beautiful it is, there's no motivation to love it deeper than just sort of like, oh, it's a farm. Mm -hmm. I also think that with the vegan situation, I understand because it, it hurts to be on the other side of when somebody's really angry at mm -hmm. choices that you're making that feel right to you. But I think we can keep in mind because for us being making the choices that we make, it naturally for our fellow farmer who's next door that might make different choices, it can appear as though we're like, we're right and you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And we really aren't focused on what that is. We're focused just on the choices that we make and we appreciate any open dialogue oh, with yeah. our neighbors of mm -hmm. what they are. 
And with the vegan community, there are the the nature of vegan and what i feel like is so beautiful in our world is the is a path of compassion absolutely and so mm-hmm. if the vegan uh, representation in our world is compassion and the 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 vegan that becomes attacking can be the um the the abs like the that's an abstract form of the vegan compassionate energy so that's and there's anger that's really just anger Mm-hmm. And so that anger happens. We happen to be the target of that anger, which doesn't feel good to weather. But I think it th- casts a poor shadow on the vegan community that really is about compassion and doesn't attack at all. Yeah, it's we, just the the ones that are attacking that get get the voice. Yeah, we it. have vegan, we have vegans that work on this farm. Molly was a vegetarian yeah. for fourteen years, but yeah, and I think it's it's um you know everybody's going on this journey of health and. You know, um, they're all in, entitled to that. And I think the thing we have to remember is that, you know, it, we've, we've become a culture where in order to make things change, we think the only way to do it is through intense confrontation. Mm-hmm. And the, the problem is, is that we've built a culture around this fear over the unknowns and this fear of climate, this, the, this fear of animal agriculture. And that turn, that gets people to look away. And, and, the, and the looking away part, the thing they're not doing anymore is they're not innovating. And what we need to do is be able to talk about tough issues where we disagree with things and be, and be respectful and, and build a culture of innovation and understanding. Because honestly, the vegan movement is going to drive more farms to be more humane. And I think that's a good thing. You know, and we need that extreme sort of pendulum swing right now. We just need to do it without killing and shaming the farmers that are trying to find the middle ground to get us there. It's so important. So, I I think I have vegans on my podcast. I was on someone another vegans podcast, and he yeah. you, he was. I love that we have probably more in common than we have not. Oh, right, we're sure. both we have the same goals. We both want health. We both want to have humane treatment of animals. All this stuff. They just kind of went down a different path. Yeah, and it's like meeting in the middle is just if we could. I feel like the soil health is that meeting in the middle. Well, yeah. anyone who cares about animals or the environment or like health is empathic. You know, and they and they care for something oftentimes outside of themselves. And that is our I think that is our mutualistic connection, you know, um, and we're all stumbling around in that world trying to figure out what it means. And I, I love that you said that. That's so mm-hmm. beautiful to have that awareness that we actually have a lot in common with people who have different dietary choices that are very passionate about what they believe. But we actually have this connection to this empathy that you know, the average person going to McDonald's doesn't really even know what the hell's going on and doesn't care about anything in that way, you know. <laughs> That's a bigger picture. I think that when we were on this uh, video podcast I did with him, he's at the end, he's like, at least more people are going to care about health. Yeah. He's excited about my movie, even though it's completely opposite of him. He's like, I want to get out to the most people possible because if you get to that McDonald's person to actually think about it, that's the ultimate goal. It's consciousness. It's yeah. just raising consciousness in whatever yeah. form that takes and allowing open dialogue within that without shaming. I love it. So we could wrap it up here in a second. What what would you do if you weren't doing this? Can you imagine? Like, what would you do? Like, now that you're eight years into this farm, can you? What what, what would you be, else would you be doing? There's absolutely nothing else in the world I want to do, <laughs> <laughs> except maybe be a potter. That sounds fun. <laughs> That's new. I've never heard that. Before. <laughs> a dancer, but a I'm dancer. not. I, I can't. I'm 41 years old. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There's, the good thing about this is that I've I, in in the last eight years I've never said I'm bored, mm-hmm. and I've never felt like there's not something creatively for my brain to work on solving. Mm-hmm. And I've I've become way more hopeful about what's happening with the climate and the environment through what I now understand in this infinite ability for ecosystems to heal themselves if we um, allow them certain graces. So I don't know what else I'd be doing. I would probably be a lot more worried and scared about what's gonna happen with the planet when it comes to the climate. And instead, actually by being a steward within it, I've become more hopeful mm. of, uh, for its resiliency. How can, how can other people do this? Like how, like, you know, people say we can't feed the world like this. 
I say otherwise. Well, there's not. First of all, there's not a food shortage. So anyone yeah. that's saying that is is using some old thing they heard their grandfather say outside yes. of a coffee shop. Um, there's not a food shortage, um, and we are about feeding our communities. You know, uh, I think it's something like 75 percent of the world's food is grown on farms 25 acres or less. Yeah. We're a 214 acre farm. We're growing a lot of food, but the goal is not to feed the world and it should have never been to feed the world. That's something that came post World War II, right? After like victory gardens because they mm-hmm. were concerned about food shortages. You want to ask about food shortages? Ask Germany. They got themselves in a big old pickle when they couldn't grow food anymore. That was one of the reasons, you know, it's one of the things that hurt them the most. But like countries that are, um, actually addressing the needs of small farmers are the countries that are going to have the most resilience to any sort of food shortage or food crisis. Also, it's the fun part about local food is that it's so incredibly delicious. If Mm -hmm. we can just focus on building a patchwork across the United States of different local farms that are connected to their local community, we not only develop community again, which is such an important vital aspect for mental health, but then we create the most delicious food system that we possibly could because what creates delicious food is delicious soil and Mm. proximity to the ground. So if you just pick, pick that recently, Mm -hmm. it's going to be amazing so people on an everyday basis can simply get to know a farmer either make a choice yourself to grow some things i started with a porch garden we had a small garden in our backyard in baltimore but then you can take that further by if you don't do it yourself then just find somebody who is and really appreciate who that person is and come to know them they're growing your food they're your sustenance I think access to the internet is giving people this false sense and pressure to be the savior of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about like, what are we going to do to save the planet and how can I save the world? How can I make uh, an entire uh, movement that I care about better? But the reality is, is that that's an, um, an unfair expectation to put on ourselves. And, you know, if you care about something, you know, You caring about something is enough if you just show the rest of the world through your small example of how it can be done. That's enough inspiration. And then it becomes, like Molly said, the patchwork quilt that ultimately gets replicated. All us regenerative farmers are doing are reminding the world what it used to be like to interact with an ecosystem. That's all we're doing. And if we start to focus like 6% of the population in that direction, that may be all it really needs to bring about a significant change, both climate-wise and health-wise, to completely change what we know of as a planet right now. That's amazing. Yeah, are are only 1% farmers right now in America? I think we're getting a knock. So are you saying we should get back to just, I think more people should just get into farming in general. Well, I think it... I think it's a way of life that will solve a lot of problems, including one that where, you know, everyone is seeking meaning and purpose in their life, but undervaluing reconnection, not only to each other, like true, deep, vulnerable reconnection, but a reconnection of vulnerable and humil- humble form of reconnection to nature. It makes anything you do from a meaning and purpose perspective that much better. So if I could ever like impart wisdom to my son, I would say, yeah, seek meaning, seek purpose, but for God's sakes, don't miss the opportunity for reconnection. And that's what farming gives you is that gift of reconnection to the purpose and meaning of life. Wow. This is, this is a beautiful, I love this so much. I I wish everyone could see this and share this and hopefully I can share some of these messages in the film. And on a closing note, I just love that, that feed your community. I, I didn't, I heard people say this before and I didn't really understand it. They're like, how do we feed the world? Feed your community. And I didn't really get it, but it, it's so true. Is if you feed your community, then by default, if everyone does that, you are feeding the world. You're feeding the world. And there's always, there's a reason we had to connect as a whole globe. So there's a reason why we kind of lost sight for a minute. And now we really understand as our one earth, what we're all doing. The internet was a huge, obviously, part of mm-hmm. that reconnection. But now, okay, that's there, that's fine, and there's Mm. gonna be a system that supports that to a certain extent. But let's get back to feeding our community, and that patchwork is everything. And how much fun would travel be if when we traveled, we went to these places that, oh, we don't grow that very well here, and oh, let's go there because we can taste that. That's Mm. the way it used to be with travel. You would experience the olive oil here and the nuts Mm. there. Mm. And if we can do that, have that vibrant food in our own community, sit around the table together, enjoy what 
what we've worked really hard to grow. Have the day a year where you all can tomatoes together. Get back to the roots of what that means. I think that there will be so much more just deep contentment that we can establish across the U.S. And I hope that happens. And I also want that to happen in my life because I want to eat the delicious food that the United <laughs> States starts to grow. Because if we fix our food system, I think we will be fixing so many problems that we face today. Everything else will fall into place. Yes. Healthcare, all of it. This is such a beautiful conversation. Thanks for having me up here. I love everything Absolutely. you're doing. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for your interest in it. And all right. Doing. It's yeah. great. Everyone, watch the film. Do you have a website? Um, well, the movie website is uh, like the biggest little farm. You just movie. Google the biggest little yeah. farm. Yeah. The biggest little farm. You can get it on um, Apple, Amazon. It's on Hulu streaming. You can uh, YouTube. You can buy it there. Uh, and then there's DVD. Um, and then if you want to learn more about us, it's apricotlanefarms.com. Um, and Instagram. Yeah. You're on Instagram? And we are on Instagram. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we canceled our MySpace page. <laughs> <Not anymore. laughs> Finally gave up on it. I was oh. trying to keep it alive. <laughs> I had 75 people. Oh, yeah. yeah. Still taking away. Right. right, yeah. No, we'd love to connect with people. And we do tours once a month, but not that often. Um, once a month during the uh, warmer season when there's not fires. All right. Come on up. It's close to LA. I got here in an hour. And thanks again. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. All right. That's great. All right. Come back next week for some more great stuff. In the meantime, go to nosetail.org for all the grass-finished meat delivered to your door. Sapien.org to find out about all the things we're doing, including this podcast, Food Lies Film, the Sapien Health Technology. You can join the newsletter. You can read articles. Just tons of stuff going on. So check out sapien.org, and I'll see you next week. Stay happy and healthy, my friends. Yeah.